Thanks so much, John, for coming on uh, on the Leggett podcast. I was, I was thinking when I was driving here, this is the sort of statue of guests that we can get when you say you've got one leg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you had two legs, I wouldn't know. <laughs> So and that's true. That, that literally is. That, that, we... that is true. That's how we mess. We mess at a bar in, in, in Mallorca where, uh, what's that bar called? Roxy's, isn't Roxy's, it? Roxy's, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he, he, he was there <laughs> with his... With his uh, but you know, just before you his... tell the story, one thing which I will give to you is I'm not much of a kind of celeb. Can, you know, you see someone, you're like, oh, I'm not really one of these people that goes up and gets a selfie or asks for a, you know, a chat. But I must admit, I've had a couple of beers. I was like... That's John Bishop, <laughs> and I did go over, and it's not normally like me to be fair. Yeah, well, actually, yeah, I well, talking about that, Mallorca, well, actually, that, that says a lot about me, don't it? You've yeah. got to be pissed to go <laughs> off. All right, I might as well bother. <laughs> I, I actually saw, I think I saw, I saw you flying from uh, Mallorca to Manchester. Actually, I, I talked to my girlfriend about this last night, and you're on the plane. And people kept on going up and down to see if it was you, right. <laughs> You know, like whispers carry yeah. through a plane, like like Jesus. And I thought to myself, I'm not just saying this because you're here, but I thought, fuck me, that must be so. You know, when you the 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 most stressful place for me is an airport, and then to have to deal with that. Well, you know what? The worst thing is we're coming. This is first world problems, but yeah. Mallorca, <laughs> there used to be a way through the back back way. They used to have this uh, VIP bit, and you could get a card or something, a priority pass for that. And it used to get you through this VIP bit. And, and I was shown it by somebody. And uh, it was Jamie, <laughs> all right, so, uh, Jamie Redknapp oh, showed me. <laughs> Put the boom. Yeah, because <laughs> we used to always go on holiday together with families in Mallorca. And we were there once and he went, go through this bit. And you, you, that little pass that you have for the lambs, it gets you through this bit. And they've stopped that. So on the first time that we stopped it, we were flying. Because there's no way of going from up here to Mallorca, yeah, posh, yeah. you're either on a Jet 2 or a Ryan, <laughs> which yeah. is all it fine. Was a jet two, yeah. You're all fine. And that's fine when you're on, a, on the plane. The plane gets you from there to there. But at the first time we turned up at the airport, we weren't able to slip through that other bit. We had to get in that snaky line yeah, bit. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah, when you're checking yeah, yeah. in. <laughs> and that's when it's awkward because you're <laughs> passing people and they're looking and go, is that him? Is that him? Well, I don't yeah. know. I just think I, f- I don't like him anyway. And then, <laughs> and then you sneak back and then you see the same people. And it's so funny because it starts off at the start of the line. People are interested. By the time you go up and past them about four times, no one's bothered. Yeah, yeah. By which point I've took me cap off and I'm like that <laughs> anyone want to pick you <laughs> but oh. we met we were in the bar and you come over and you, you sort of uh, asked for a picture and we were having a chat and I thought I, c- I can't I've, I've got to go what, what, you know, what happened to your leg because people I should imagine well, that's people what, sometimes don't don't even address it and that's the worst thing you can tell and they, they can't do that thing with their eyes where they're looking at you in, like, in your face but then they're going <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, you know what's what's that going on? And yeah, you just straight out went. What happened to your leg? Within two minutes of speaking, to <laughs> I was like, all right, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, then that's how we got chatting on it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's it. We kept in touch since. And then he said, you know, do you want to come and see me kitchen with a bloke you don't know? <laughs> <laughs> with two video cameras, <laughs> two really video are. cameras, but we'll keep the dog upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, mate, I really well, appreciate this, mate. And, and like I say, the whole idea was. The last 10 years for me has been pretty mental. I mean, all the things that I've... I mean, I guess you could say that with anyone's life, that if you, you know, turn left instead of right, you wouldn't be in here or there. But for me, if I hadn't been blown up, probably wouldn't have met you, probably wouldn't have done all these amazing things. So the idea with the podcast, to link up with Tom and interview people who have had interesting lives. And the one thing that really interested me about your life when I knew you were going to come and have a chat was just how much your life did change. As in, you were pretty normal fella I'm not saying you're not normal now but I mean <laughs> no later, later like you got to a point in your life where you know you're just a normal fella if you like and then so it, that, yeah, it yeah. seemed like it probably for you is something you've worked at for a while but I guess to everyone else it was like you know overnight now and it's, yeah it's it's, like, that it's, can sometimes be offensive when someone says it's overnight when you've been striving for years I don't yeah. mean it in effect like it's like that saying it takes 20 years to become an overnight success yeah, yeah and it's probably true and it's probably more, if you like, I don't know whether offensive is the right way, but it's probably more of a, a an insult to people who have strived for it for 20 years. Mm. But I haven't. 
<laughs> the, you know the you truth. Not, you don't feel like you don't? No, no, because the, the truth is, it's now what is it? It's it's twenty two thousand and nineteen, and I did my first ever walk on stage to do an open spot, which is where you know, like you, you're not getting paid and you're just trying out in October two thousand. So that's like that's like nineteen years. And you go, all right, well that's a long time, but in reality, for the first. Four or five years, I never ever took it as more than just a bit of a hobby. Yeah. I never thought I'd do it as a job. I never watched stand up. I never went to comedy clubs. I've been to two comedy clubs in my whole life. Now I was 35 years of age when I first walked on a stage. So I had no, it wasn't as if I was chasing a dream. It just wasn't a dream That's I ever had. That's bad, isn't it? Was, it, you, was you told you were funny, like, you know, people are like, you should give this a go? Well, was it, you were talking before about when you do your motivational talks or companies and stuff. And I used to be a sales manager, so I used to do presentations. And so there was a little bit of, like, talking in front of people wasn't alien to me. But it is different. When, you know, I, don't, I don't do a gig with a PowerPoint. I don't, I don't say that. And I go, oh, there you go. There's a graph showing how much you've laughed. You know, yeah. that's, so I, I was used to a little bit standing in front of people, but there was a structure to it. And some people say, I remember there was a girl, because I worked for a pharmaceutical company. So, oh, did you? Yeah. What was the name? What's the name? Well, it, it started off as a company called Syntex that did a... Uh, uh, Ro- Rosh bought that, didn't they? Yeah, how do you know oh, that? Tom was a geek. He's a how does Tom laboratory? know that? I'm not having that, Tom. How do yeah, you know no, that? We, we did work Rosh Diagnostics, yeah. Who, who's we? <laughs> <laughs> me, me, the firm, the company I work for, yeah. Uh, which is what? Uh, it's called uh, a port. So we we do a lot of uh, instrument moves, relocation. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, this is an it, interview. It, it, this is it, this is it. <laughs> instrument move. What's an yeah. instrument move? So if you've got like a mass spec or piece of equipment yeah. in a lab then yeah we move that from a to b and then we'll sort out the decommissioning recommissioning post-qualification right yeah so, I'll how, see you later, how, <laughs> so i'm gonna have to get into this it's a long story yeah well come it's, on no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously how, how have you what's the link between you two so i asked andy to come on my podcast We've got podcasts flying around the front yeah. center here haven't we yeah so i asked him to come on mine and then we sort of uh Sort of hit it off as, as such from there, and then he so said he won. So, what's your podcast based around them? It's called Stories in Business. So, and that came from you doing a, a presentation. Or I what? actually, I, I think I read his book. Right. Yeah, mm. I think well, I read it? your book first off. Yeah. Yeah, and then just from that, I've always wanted to do it, and Tom was mega helpful and said, you know, I get all this. I'll, he'd give me a list of what stuff to get, and said I'll help you set it up, and because I got a few contacts and knew a few people who had interesting stories, and didn't just want to do it on my own. Because I think yeah, it's yeah, good yeah. having a three-way kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, because it, it, it can get stale. And you're sometimes and thinking you need... of the next questions and stuff. And... But, but also as well, like it, everyone else brings something to a yeah. conversation, doesn't it? And I, the thing with me that I like about podcasts is that it, if, if they're done properly, I always think, because I listen to them when I'm travelling, mm. and I think if they're done properly, you feel you're in the room with yeah, people, yeah. you're sharing the moments, it breaks a degree of loneliness, really, because <laughs> it, it, get, it gets it gets a conversation flowing. 100%. And like, like when, when there's a proper podcast, it's, a, it's something that's interesting. Yeah. If it's just a series of gags or <clears> jokes <throat> or, or yeah. setups, it doesn't really work. So it, it's hard, it's hard, it is quite hard to get that feel, I think, because it's weird. as soon as you put three microphones in front of people, Maybe not you, yeah. But anyone else, I think, suddenly you, in the back of your mind, you know you're being recorded, and it's hard to have that sort of a conversation that you'd have at the, you know, at the dinner table. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, and also, like you just said about the next question, it's like when you when you are interviewing, it's hard to think because you've got to you've got to listen to what the person's saying, yeah. but then you've got to take snippets. Yeah. It's probably exactly what you do well, when you're, you're doing it for the show, didn't you? If, mm. if someone heckles you or things like you, you try and pick things up, but you're trying to listen to also what they are you're all you're always thinking ahead yeah but uh, having said that uh, that's like normal isn't it? that's mm. life isn't it? yeah you yeah. know what i mean if you, yeah. you nobody goes out and just sits there and goes right well they finished what they said i need five minutes to think about something you fill in a gap that's I, normal I used, I used to do a thing in my motivational talk and it used to go down like a lead balloon the odd time it'd get a laugh but i had to take it out in the end and it's that kind of dark humor and there was a bit when um, i talk about just being blown up so obviously the room's a very somber atmosphere in the room at this point and then I say I wake up two weeks later from my coma and I look to the left hand side and my dad's sitting there and I'm 
give me dad a big hug, have a big cry, you know, I tell him I'm sorry for getting blown up. And at that moment you get like a little, hmm, which is nice. And then I say, and then I look to my right and I see my best mate, Ian, who, um, who thankfully survived as well. And he said, Andy, you know, I've been waiting for you to wake up. I don't remember anything about being in Afghanistan. Next thing I know is I wake up here, you know, what happened? And I turned to him and said, mate, you really don't know what happened? He said, mate, no, I've not got a clue. I said, you got us fucking blown up by jumping over that ditch, you idiot. <laughs> and no one laughed. And I was like, <laughs> I won't take the piss like that again. <laughs> and I was like, is that commando human that we have? But telling the corporate world that, you know, corporate yeah, mates but, are... but also, also, it's context, isn't it? Like, if mm. they don't know him, they don't yeah. know the situation, there's always that little bit of... I have uh, to drop it because it's just... I thought oh, it was funny, but yeah, it was. Tough. I've done that. I've done that loads of times. There's yeah. loads of times when I when I do a tour because I don't don't write notes down beforehand, and I just do loads and loads of warm up gigs, loads of little gigs, and get little bits that oh, I think well that'll stick together. That was there's always something where I think right, that's great. That and then no one laughs, yeah. and my tour manager ends up saying, you know, after about twelve goals, listen. You've got to leave Stop that. I'm going, no, 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 they'll get it in the end. It's about a dog that's got three legs. They'll love it. Just let me try I it. I would have loved it, mate. There's <laughs> <laughs> a good connection there. So anyway, coming back to your thing. So I went to, we went on a works to do, of the two times I went to comedy clubs, I went with a works do, because by then I'd left Syntex, was with this company, Fuji Sound. We had a, we had a girl who worked in our um, medical information called Bernie. And we were at the gig at the comedy store in London. And and it, it was good. I remember some of the lads who were on the, the line-up show. Mayo was on and they come out and they go that. And then she turned to me and said, you should do that. No, and I, I don't know what made her say that because I'd never had an aspiration to do it because, as I say, it was not on the radar. And then you, do you think if you, you know, sort of looking back then, I suppose that was the pivotal point, I suppose, wasn't it? What? That Bernie saying... No. No. No, Jesus. Did you not like your job at the time in it, or was you happy in it? No, my job was all right. My, uh, at the time of doing it, I was sales and marketing manager for... uh, um... Yeah, you sound tired talking about it. No, (laughs) no, I was was putting it all in context because the job I had was looking after this... uh, product called uh, Tacrolimus or Prograph, which stopped people rejecting their organs after a transplant. So there's nothing, like, funny about it. Do you know what I mean? It's <laughs> not like you think, oh, this is a laugh, isn't it? I've just been in a, in, yeah. a, in a clinic talking about kidney transplants. I'd love to be a comedian. <laughs> it, there's, there's no link to it. So that world had no, nothing to do with why I did it. I don't think... You know, I did it, yeah, I've said before, like, I did it because I split up with my missus, I was looking for something, something to do on a Monday night and I ended up in this comedy club and and it was that thing where the guy on the door said it's an open mic night. I didn't even know what it meant because I'd never been to an open mic, so I didn't know what that you know that phrase meant. And he said, well, it means that if you put your name down and you get up, you don't pay. He said, but if, you, if you're going to go in, it's four quid. And I was getting divorced, and I thought, well, that's, <laughs> that's four quid. She's not going to have is it. So I, I put my name down, literally thinking I'd never get called out. Literally. Did you have anything in your mind thinking, what I've, you must have been thinking, surely, once you, once you sat down? Well, what I, I walked, there was only seven people in there. And I walked in, I was thinking, oh, fucking hell, what am I going to do with seven people in there? And I, 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 you know, you're talking about moments that change your life. You know, you're talking about the moment where you got blown up. You talking about you know that 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 second that could have been different, uh, and this is nowhere near as dramatic as yours. But like my life, I think definitely changed within fifteen minutes because my name got called out second, and and I and as I say, there were seven people in the audience. Most of them were on the list to go on the stage. <laughs> it was like a self help group, and it was just. <laughs> Or if anyone's ever been to an open mic night, some of them are great. You see a little bit of talent, but some of them are like, "Oh my yeah. God, they are!" They do the people go and then they do they do the same five minutes that they did last week to all their mates in the audience who then critique them and then they go back. And and this is sometimes the problem. I think sometimes people who who are so desperate to do something, particularly with, with comedy, they overanalyze it. And I just get on stage and believe in it, and 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 you kind of sell a joke, and and then people believe in you. Mm. Whereas mm-hmm. I've often seen people who are fantastic 
the material's brilliant, but they just don't sell it, and so it falls flat. And sometimes you see them in this in the open mic circuit with the working and trying to craft something so much it never gets to where it needs to be. And it was a little bit like that. And, and, did, I, and did that help because you sort of didn't care as much? Oh, yeah, I didn't yeah. care. You didn't give a shit? No, well, thought. listen, I mean, like, the, the fella on before me was doing chicken impressions. <laughs> like, and I'm not kidding you. He was literally, I was sat there, he, he, I was 35, he looked like he was a similar age, and he, his whole thing was like, hey, hey, ever seen a chicken driver van? <laughs> hey, what's it like getting chased by a chicken? <laughs> and it was like, I was thinking, it's just care in the community, or what I'm looking. And a, and a couple of other people in the audience go, <laughs> yeah, to the last time. And I'm like, oh. and the 15 minutes that changed my life was the fact that I got called out second. If I'd have been called out third, my name would have been third. I think I might have already left. Mm. But it was my name was called out second. And that happened. That that thing happened where I walked on stage. And I and I remember every every second of the walker on stage because it was in a place called the Frog and Bucky Comedy Club in Manchester. And I was in the audience, so because I was in the audience and my name got called out, I walked on stage from the audience instead of, you know, going backstage. So every time I did that club afterwards, even like when I broke through, I always come on from the front. It just became my yeah, thing yeah. to come on from the front, walk on stage. And, and, and I walked on stage and I remember turning around and the, the lights were there. And I'd never been on a stage. You know, it was, it was October. 2000 in November I turned 35 so I was just short of 35 I remember standing there looking at the lights and the first thing I ever said on stage was fuck me there Bryce <laughs> and then and then I just stood there and I thought I'm not gonna say and I've been talking to a mate on the way in about um this was when there was a, a blockade going on in France the, the lorry drivers and no, the farmers, the farmers in France were blocking the roads and they were building up barricades and setting them on fire, all these haystacks. So all the English lorry drivers couldn't get home. <laughs> it was something to do with like a fuel, fuel disputes yeah. or something. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. And, and so, and you, so they had all these English lorry drivers going, I can't get home. I can't get home. I'm stuck. The, the French won't let me through the border. And I went on stage and, <clears> and the only sort of half funny thing I had in my head was, hey, Hey, seeing them French, see them farmers blocking the borders, I hey? <laughs> Wouldn't it have been good if they'd have done that in 1939? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, then, and, then and, then I, and then I stopped and I just thought, I don't know what to say because I had nothing else. And I was looking at these other people in the room and I thought, oh, what am I going to do? I thought, and then I thought, I've got nothing to lose because there's only, so there's only six other people here. One of them thinks he's a chicken. So I just, <laughs> I literally stood there and I, and again, this was, I suppose, fate. Because if I'd have had a load of jokes, if I'd have prepared them, had I'd have just said GB jokes. No, no. no. I, I, I'd, have, I'd have said jokes because I didn't have anything prepared. I just stood there. I just uh, <sighs> I'm getting divorced. <laughs> <laughs> I just talked about splitting up and getting divorced. And, and I just... I just talked about all of that and, and there's always a red light that flashes when your time's up and this light was flashing. I didn't know that that meant my time was up. <laughs> so again, I was going, oh, look, your light's broke. Anyway, <laughs> and then she said this to me and then I, and, 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 and the kids aren't happy. And I was doing all of this stuff and uh, they, they ended up playing music to get me off, right? Played that Pearl and Dean music. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah. They played that to get me off because that's what they used to do at the club if someone was dying to get them oh. off and play music. And I come off and uh, the compa who's on tonight at the gig tonight, Mick Ferry, uh, great, great comic, just came up to me at the end. He came up to me at the end and the owner of the club and just said, look, you, know, you should, have you done this before? And I said, I've not, never done it. And he said, well, we do this every Monday. Why don't you come back and do it? Because he, uh, he said, you, you've got something. Mm -hmm. You know, just come up, try and think of jokes. That bit where you get divorced 
and you started crying. That wasn't the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> try not do that again. But, but, um, but try and think of something. And literally, that's how it started. Is it? Sorry, mate. Is it? Is it a welcoming world when you first that that open mic or comedy? Yeah. It is. I not... found I found comedy for very egalitarian in the fact that anyone can enter it. Right. And it's a meritocracy. If you're good, you're good. Yeah. That's it. You know, like there's no. People can't, people may not like what you do. You know what I mean? There's all different tastes and people might go, I just don't like him. He's, he's just not for me. But when you're on stage in a room full of strangers and you say something, people laugh or they don't laugh. No one thinks about it. It's the, it's the most instant form of communication yeah. there is. No one goes, oh yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, it's a reaction. So, it, so what that means is that on the circuit, if you come in, this is what I found, this really surprised me. If you come in and you start doing the open spot bit and you're good, then the other acts will tell you you're good, you know, mm. and they'll, they'll, they'll confirm it with you. And then what I found, and it, whether it's changed, I don't know, but then then people start giving you numbers and say, phone that promoter, or this is a good gig, I've told them about you, I've given you a number, and then, That's good time, and, and then you start getting booked. And then what happens, you go through this, process of getting in better clubs and better clubs and then you end up on a, on, on a good circuit and then you start going through the lineup from you know the opening act the middle act and then you end up being the headline act yeah and then when you're the headline act you're there because everyone in that room sort of is expecting the most of you and then that's your opportunity when you're on the circuit and you're the headline act and you're bursting through everywhere you then, if you're lucky enough, you move on to the mm. other things like telly or, or, you know, you never lose that ability. But there's a, I think there's a window of about 18 months where you've got to capitalise on it. Because right. at that point, you are just the best. I remember Alan Carr started, and I was talking to Alan about this only recently. That's another name, isn't it? <laughs> but, um, but I was talking to him about it because it was a real wake-up moment for me because I had the job. I never, ever thought of leaving the job. Yeah. I had a good job, and I just thought, well, this is Andy. I was doing a few sportsman's dinners and a few clubs, you know, once a month or something. I'd do a weekend at a club, and then I was booked, and Alan had started at the same time. There was me, him, this Mick Ferry again, and we were in... Um, a gazebo in Oldham. <laughs> at this place in Oldham. It was more like a, a hotel that had a, a, an orangery at the back. And they tried to put a gig on and for loads of reasons, you know, that's not the best idea. <laughs> not that it's in Oldham. No, but it, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't the, the Oldham, but it was just on this hill in Oldham. And I, I, I just remember it. And Alan had reached that point of being... On the trajectories. Like, yeah, yeah, he was just he was just starting to break through with Channel Four, I think, or it was just short of when he broke through with Channel Four. But it was a moment where you stand there and go, he's definitely the funniest person in this room. Yeah. He just got it. He did. It was a di it was an awkward gig to do because it wasn't a standard venue and stuff, and he just absolutely nailed it. Mm. And that's where you go ah, and that's what that's what made me think. You're mm. not going to be that good unless you do it full time. Mm. You just that, that's what be. I was going to say before. You just kind of led on to it perfect. Do you think? Because I'm I'm a little bit like this. I that that fear of being on stage and thinking I might look like a twat for the next ten minutes. That it's that kind of that f uh, fight or flight. Yeah. Some people well, I yeah. didn't think of anything worse, and obviously you didn't mind that. I'm the kind of person I like being outside my comfort zone. Do you think? Yeah. Eventually, that's what made you then. I, do, I think there's an element of that, but also, it's what you said before, like, I, I just kept on thinking, well, this isn't a job, is it? I've no desire to do this. I don't, I'm not trying to impress somebody apart from, like, make people laugh. I'm not hoping there's an agent in the audience who's going to sign mm. me or a, a TV pro I do, It was just never, ever I going... I think the fact that you're talking about stuff that everyone can relate to as well, that always seems to yeah. be your comedy, especially... Well, I think that's because, again, because I came from that point of walking on the stage without anything... Mm. I've only I've always thought well the best thing to do is to look at yourself instead of instead of and I still don't sit down and craft loads and loads of stuff because I just think it's got to feel organic and in the room and to do that it's got to be normal stuff. I said this to me dad so you, you might see me in ten years time the next John Bishop but I I'd love to go and do one of these open nights just to see if 
just to do it, just to do 10 minutes and see if yeah. I went, just that fear thing. And my dad's first thing, my dad's like, well, you're not funny though. And I said, no, I know I'm not funny. I admit I'm not funny, but I've had some funny stories. So f- this isn't going to be like my my moment to shine. But for example... <laughs> this is the pivot moment Yeah, this, now. Is, this is my pivot moment. I remember I started doing this public speaking and I went down and done a talk for um, this big finance company in London. And I'm just a young lad. I was, think I was 24, 25 from, uh, like from Bootle. Anytime I go for a drink or a meal, I just order a pint of lager. That's all I used to drink. Now I like a glass of red, but back then it was just lager. Anyway, do this talk, and then this guy, the CEO, takes me out for, for um, dinner in this posh restaurant. I'm sitting next to the CEO, and it's all very, you know, and I'm not used to it, none of that really. And being from Liverpool, if, if anyone says you were red, what does that normally mean? Liverpool yeah, or yeah, Everton, yeah. isn't it? So, and at the time, I hated red wine, couldn't stomach it. And the guy says, so Andy, um, so are you a red? And I went, yeah, I'm big, big red. I just started <laughs> pouring this, started pouring this glass of red wine. And I'm sitting there going, fuck, I don't even like red wine. And for the next two hours, I had to just sip this glass of red wine. So it's like, I've got loads of stories like yeah. that, which I know I'm not funny, but again, listening to your comedy, what, what makes you, what makes me a big fan of you, is you're telling stories like when you said about when you love someone, your wife, and you're like, you don't truly love someone until you notice them breathing and you think, <laughs> you know like just little things yeah. you think god yeah you know I mean? but it is I think it's got to be relatable to, to me anyway I like I like the comedians that I like or the comedy that I like is when you feel like you're meeting somebody you feel like the, you know if somebody if somebody stands on stage and says uh, right you know politics blah 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 you go well how hard is it to say it? All, all politicians are dickheads they're mm. all stupid how hard is that that's not hard you know, you need all right. Sometimes you are know, political humour is good, and you can re- twist it round. But I'm not into that mud slinging. Mm. I'm I'm more into that like, like look at your life, and if you've got a point to make, that's fine. But make it relevant to yeah. other people. Don't mm. just stand there and when people come to a comedy club so that they learn how to think. They're in the wrong fucking place. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you don't know your own opinion on yeah. Brexit, you're a bell end. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I mean. That's, this shows maybe my level of intelligence. But some of the funniest jokes I remember, this might have been when you first start, you can tell me, but I always remember a joke you told and I must have been the tip that week or something that weekend. And you told a joke about going to a tip and dropping a washing machine on oh, something. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and I remember like the rigmarole sometimes you'd have a go on the tip and you'd said this, this bit about... You go with a with a fridge or something or a washing machine, and you're like, "Oh mate, you can't just turn up at that here." It's like, "What do you want me to do?" Well, you got to ring up first. So <laughs> he rings up, mate. I'm here with the t- yeah, yeah. Like oh, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, brilliant. you know that again. You know, you sort of changes of things. I was um, so I I decided to leave my job, give it a go, and then uh, then I I, uh, I I was with an agent at the time, big agent in London, and. Uh, and so I said, right, I'm going to leave me job. <laughs> I said, I said, I've decided I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to leave me job. <laughs> and he went, why? <laughs> I said, because I think I can make it. And he yeah. went, well, you want to have a think about that. Are you really sure? <laughs> yeah, it's a killer blow. <laughs> Are you sure? So, so I left me job. And then the week after, I left me agent. So I had no job and no agent. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I've got to make this work. So and then I was trying to do things. I I'd, I set up my own little tour. I did 11 dates, uh, one being the Royal Court in Liverpool, which did all right. And then a little, little small room in Lowry and then that other place. And one of them, one of them was in, uh, oh God, what was it called? Something like the Phoenix or something in Burnley. <laughs> and, 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 and I honestly, and, and, I, and I'd said to Melanie, I said to me, Mrs, because we got back together at that point, we had three kids and your know, mortgage and all that, and I said, look, I want to leave me job, and it's a good job, but I think as long, I said, I'm not going to go up there, I said, but I'll be able to cover the bills, I'll do a sportsman's mm-hmm. dinner there, and, you know, there might be, I was doing a bit on Radio City, something might come, but I've got to, and she was great, she said, well, you've got to do what you've got to do, so I said, I promise you, I promise you at least we'll break even and i'm gonna do this little tour and i was literally i left me house in this place this 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 place in uh burnley i'm trying to remember the name i'm sure it's the phoenix or something like that it was like a pub is it still, used... is it still around or not no because no. it was a fella trying to do comedy nights in in, in in a room above the pub 
And then for whatever reason, at that time, he was saying, OK, if you're a tour and you can come in. And like you'll find out why it didn't work. So <laughs> it didn't work because he was doing it once a month. And I said, I booked it. I said, look, can I, can I, can I, I book it and I'll put it on my tour? It looks good on the post. And no one needs to know. It's just a room above a pub. And I, I, got, I remember leaving the house, sitting in the car, and he phoned up. And he said, uh, listen, son, no, do, don't come tonight. <laughs> I, said, I said, but it's on my tour poster. I said, it, 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 you know, come. He said, no, son. He said, uh, he said, we've not sold any tickets. I said, no. He said, no. I said, well, people might turn up. He said, no, I don't think so. We're going <laughs> to use room for Pilates. <laughs> I used the room for Pilates. I was double booked for people stretching, and I thought, and I thought, I can't go in. I can't go back in and say to Manly and all that giggles. So I just went. I just drove around. I just drove around for a few hours and went home. She said that was. I said it wasn't great. It wasn't. <laughs> mate, what is? Sorry, mate. What did you know when you you split up with your missus at the time? What what um what did she think when you said I'm gonna do this comedy or when you? Well, she found night? out. She came to a club when I was on. It's a long story, but she she didn't know I was on, and then because we weren't seeing each other we were like 18 months apart then and we didn't really see each other she came with people that I didn't know who didn't know me who she was working with mm. so she turns up at this club and then I walk on well, stage and she was like all, and obviously the people she was with didn't know because they didn't know me because mm. we've been apart you know what I mean so it, it was so it was through all of that that we got back together and one of the things I said to her is when we got back together is look I can't not do this <clears throat> this is just something I've got to do and it helps because I get a few quid for it but it's it's a bit more than that I just think I need to do it and it was never like this time next year we'll be millionaires and uh, no 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 so coming back to the to the fridge thing right let me tell you this because this is <laughs> so so then i left my agent tried to set up this tour didn't and i was bubbling along <clears throat> bubbling along bubbling along and then and then uh and then jason manford had this agent and he, and he was doing well and he was getting on eight out of ten cats and stuff like that and he said to his agent look you've you've got a come and see this this John Bishop and she was going yeah well, well and in the end I thought and he was saying to me you've got to go meet me agents and I went, oh. so I thought right and this is like I've been full time for a few years for two and a half years and I thought oh, well I will so I, I, I set up some appointments with agents in London and I went round them I went round three of them uh, one of them just went no no just don't think you've got it yeah. and I'm like fuck it out you what know, is it you're having to do a yeah I just went them. no I just went down they all knew I was yeah we'll have a meeting and she 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 met me to tell me she thought I was no good <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that affects your ego doesn't it and then there was another one who at the time was managing Russell Brand and he was going to go to uh, LA with Russell Brand who was doing a film. I went, oh, I don't want that. I need some. And then there was Jason's agent, Lisa, who I ended up signing for and I went and then, I, I, I went and I met, I didn't meet Lisa. I met someone who worked for her who just sat there telling me how good Michael McIntyre was. <laughs> and I'm like, right, well, I'm not going to sign for you. So I went home without signing for any agents. And Lisa said, why haven't, you, why haven't you joined our company? I said, because someone's told you about someone else. I said, that's not what I want. She said, well, I, I see that you've got a gig in Manchester. And it was one of these one-man shows I was doing. It was in Salford. She said, I'm coming to see it on Saturday. So she turned up on Saturday. And it was a 500-seater venue that I'd sold out on my own. And she, so she comes, I did this gig, and she comes to me after, and she went, Ow. I don't understand how you're doing this without an agent. Uh, it was so funny because our Carol was there, my sister, and uh, and so I was talking to our Carol at the end, and, and Lisa came over. So Lisa, this is our Carol. And Carol went, "What do you do?" She said, "I'm an agent." She said, "Have you come to nick his money?" <laughs> <laughs> she said, "No, I've come to try and make him some." So then she she said, "Right, before we go anywhere, she said, I'm going to make some phone calls." And in telly, there's about six people who book people on shows, and she phoned all of them right, and said. I've heard of this lad, but I just don't understand why no one knows about him. And at that time, you know, I was probably then, it was like, I've been doing it about four or five years, 39, coming up to 40. And, uh, and it was brilliant. The feedback she got was three main things. She said, uh, one is your accent. 
couple of people aren't sure that your accent's going to work on telly. <laughs> so the other thing is they're saying you're too old to be regarded as a new act. You know, if you're 22, 23, then you're funky, but you're like, you're, you're a married man with kids who are nearly enough teenagers and you're in your 40 and it's kind of... So you don't know where to bracket you. And the third thing that a couple of people said is you don't look funny. <laughs> <laughs> He said, well, when you're on telly, it helps if you look funny. Or <laughs> so, so then in the end, I worked with her and I got the breakthrough and then I just couldn't get on anything. And it comes down to what we were saying before about the changes and stuff. So the big show to try and get on was Live at the Apollo. Couldn't get on it. And then they did the um, Royal Variety show. It was going to come from Liverpool. And someone said, we've got to get someone from Liverpool on it. <coughs> And this, 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 this fella came to see me doing a, uh, an act in Battersea in London in a converted public toilet, right? <laughs> I swear to God, you go downstairs to this room, there's about 25 seats in it. And so my agent said, look, Lisa, who's my agent, then said, this fella's going to come. You're a shoo There's no other Scouse acts knocking about for the Royal Variety. It'll be a big break. But all you've got to do is do a set for 15 minutes. And I walked on stage... And there was some woman pissed in the second row. And I said to her, I hate scousers. And I'm like, listen, love, I'm just... She said, what I do? And I just fucking lost it. I went, bruh, 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 bruh. <laughs> Did every echo put down? Then, and I, everyone's in the rooms laughing. I walked off and the producer from the Royal Variety was going, I don't think you can say things like that. <laughs> I said, of course I'm not going to say that. The Queen's not going to fucking heckle me, is she? <laughs> I said, I only said it because that's silly cow. So in the end, that went. And I thought, it'll never happen. And then Michael McIntyre got his, um, his road show thing, the Michael McIntyre comedy road show. When would this a bit like? So, 2000... so this would have been... 2009, 2010. Because oh, okay. he only got the comedy <clears throat> road show because Jonathan Ross was given time off the BBC because he'd done that thing with ah, Russell yeah, Brand yeah. on the yeah. radio. Yeah. The, again, this is a mad chain yeah, of yeah. events. So my previous agent who I'd left was Jonathan Ross's agent and Michael McIntyre's agent. Jonathan is, is told after the thing with Russell Brand on Radio 2, he said, look, you're going to have to have six months off. So, so Addison, is, he was called, Addison Creswell goes in and goes, right, you know, if, if you're going to have Jonathan off, you, you need something on Saturday night. What about this lad, Michael McIntyre, do comedy road shows? So the BBC just said yes straight away because yeah. it was an easy thing. And, and so, and Addison also was the, was the producer of um, Live at the Apollo. So get a phone call, couldn't get on live with the Apollo for, for anything. Get a phone call to go, like, they need a load of new acts who no one's seen before for Michael's Comedy Road Show. They're going to do it in Manchester and they want you to do it. And I said, oh, OK. I said, but, you know, we don't even know if it's going to be any good as first series, blah, blah, blah. So I turned up and as I turned up to do it, uh, I'd, done the, um, I'd done a corporate event the week before the Recycling Awards. And the recycle, I was at the Recycling Awards, I did this whole thing about taking a fridge to the dump, <laughs> only because I was doing the Recycling Awards, and it went down really well. So I, I was there at the, at the Manchester Apollo, about to do it, and then Addison, the, the, the guy who used to be my agent, came up to me, he said, right, why, boy, uh, Cockney, he went, oh, it's scarce. He said, I fucking told you I'd get you on telly. I said, you haven't got me on telly. He said, you got me on a show that we don't even know is going to be any good. I said, I said, yo, get me on live at the Apollo. I said, then you've got me on telly. And he went, oh, right, say something I've never heard before. Go on, you can't. And, <laughs> and I thought, right. And I was, so I was thinking of all my material. I thought, there can't be anyone else who's ever, ever said a story about a fridge. So I literally, because he said that, went on and did that fridge thing, which went really well. And to be fair to him, even though he'd been the agent that I left, he phoned Lisa whilst I was still on stage and booked me for live at the Apollo. And then Jonathan Ross came back on and he booked me on that. And I literally went on telly on Michael McIntyre in the July, live at the Apollo in the October, and Jonathan Ross in the February. And that that six months changed everything. That was the springboard that oh, just clicked. Absolutely. I tell you how big a springboard. I was I was on tour. 
doing all these art centres and small venues and it was steadily building up and I'd gone from selling 200 tickets a week to 400 to like I was on 900 tickets a week and I went on the Jonathan Ross show so after the live of the Apollo it was creeping up to 900 tickets a week for all the venues that I had I went on the Jonathan Ross show and that weekend sold 18,000 tickets and you go Jesus Jesus (laughs) then you know what you're talking about overnight you Mm. think shit something's different now and then, yeah, I suppose even now, do you do you sometimes think that you could go back to those days when you didn't care as much? Because now you've got this whole sort of personal brand, you've got everything to lose as such. Do you ever wish you could... Do you worry about that, I think, is the question I'm trying Isn't it, you mean the level of expectation? Yeah, and also, I think... <clears throat> when, when, you know, you just... There's pressure now, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, a lot more yeah, pressure. And, pressure. And then... You know, that phrase, you know, you're dangerous when you've got nothing to lose. And by dangerous, I mean, like, you can take more risks. You can find yourself a bit, do you, if you see where I'm going with that. Yeah, I have different nights out. That's what <laughs> <Yeah>. you mean. <laughs> There's a Palmer bit where I go Airport. to me, mates. Lads, I'm off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll leave you to it. Yeah, yeah. I'm off. No, does it... Uh, but just with comedy No, but just well, being on stage, I know exactly what you mean. There's an element where you go, right, in this room now... It's so funny, actually, when you're doing the warm-up gigs, because I, I still like popping up at comedy, you know, genuine comedy clubs and just doing a bit and you walk on. And it's the only way that you know something's funny is when it's left your mouth. What we were saying before, where you think something's funny, you, you keep trying it. So I, I, to me, that's the best way of doing it. But that means that sometimes you turn up at a comedy club on a Wednesday night and say, listen, can I get on for 10 minutes? And, mm. and they go, okay. And then you walk on and the crowd go, God, I can't believe it. Yeah, this is great. This is it. And you get a big rapture and then you go on and try some new stuff, that shit. Yeah. And, and so you walk on to cheers and then you walk off. Go, Fuck you, that yeah, yeah. He's James. He was a bit, uh, I was a bit disappointed, wasn't he? Have you found when you first, you said before about being the Scousers, have you found, go? I mean, you've done it all around the world now, have you found that you've had to massively critique what you're doing I only ask because I the hardest gig and again I'm not trying to make people laugh but there are various points in my presentation where I try and make people laugh so this is, must be a lot harder for you but I done a talk in Boston once to a pharma- pharmaceutical company actually Boston uh, America or Boston Lincolnshire Boston, <laughs> <laughs> Boston <laughs> America but it was there uh, there's a Boston what are you laughing yeah, there's there there is, a Boston yeah, and Lincolnshire yeah, yeah. No, well, that was a point where I thought I've made it big time here international oh, yeah. speaking now and it was great <clears throat> but it was in the audience, there was people from all around the world. So you had Americans, um, Germans, Italians, Chinese, everyone there. And as I'm going through the talk, I'm mentioning something about the Marines and literally the Americans going up, going, yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm talking about the war and the Germans are kind of just in the seat, just didn't really know where to. You could see they physically, um, they visibly felt uncomfortable. The Chinese just looking at me, probably thinking, I don't even understand what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. And trying to, what I'm trying to get at, depending on where you go in the country or the world, do you find it that you have to change a lot? Because that gig for me was a fucking nightmare. I tell you, the biggest thing f- for me is the day of the week. No, oh. Yeah, I I don't do Mondays. No one laughs on a Monday. I've heard you say something yeah, like No this, one yeah. laughs on a Monday. It's just Mondays are just such a hard gig. I found, actually, I found some small venues that are actually all right on a Monday, but most of the time, people, particularly if you're doing, like, if you're doing a big arena or something like that, mm. you know, you know most people there have only bought the ticket not knowing it's a Monday, yeah. and then when they've gone and looked at it the weekend, oh, for fuck's sake, it's a fucking <laughs> Could have had a drink. <laughs> no, no, no one really wants that. <clears throat> so Monday, I have found, um, I did a gig once at the, uh, the comedy store in Los Angeles. I happened to be over there. And I had no no intention. I got no intention of breaking America, not or anything like that. I'm it's never going to do the comedy it. store, isn't it in LA? It's yeah, been, it's a big, big. It's a big thing to yeah. be able to do. So so I kind of put out some feelers. I thought, oh, just for the sake of it, it'll be, it'll be a nice thing to do, won't it? Just a little thing. So I turned up and uh, and I thought, well, no one knows me, so I can just do it or any old stuff, and I can just kind of introduce myself. And I just said, you know, I had everyone young. Know, my name's John from England. The me line, the line that I was going to say was, you know, I've been married now for 23 years, on and off. You know what I mean? Just a little, just a little warmer. So I said, hi, everyone, my name's John. Uh, I'm from England. Uh, tell you a bit about myself. I've been married now for uh, 23 years. And you're like, what are you fucking clapping for? You've just 
killed the joke. That's not the good bit. Yeah. And, and and it was like that all the way through. Yeah. You say how old you're like, whoa, you're still alive. It's like, <laughs> in, the, in the end, it just become, I, I couldn't almost not do the gig because yeah. every, you know, the way it is in England, you don't realise it until you're in that situation. The way the way the English humour, or certainly you know the Scouse humour works, you build something up and then you knock it down. You build mm, it up and knock it down. Yeah. But in America, when you build it up, they think they love they, it. They, they're <laughs> cheering and you go, no, this yeah. one, stop cheering. What about when talking about the comedy show? I, th- I heard Joe Rogan Is that talking the one about that Joe Rogan always goes. Yeah, to I, yeah, yeah. Well, he was on. Was he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was on that weekend. I I heard him talk about even to the extent of how late you go on. So if people have had drinks mm. and things like that, and how difficult it can be. Oh, it's a whole yeah. change, yeah. Do you tend to have a drink before a gig, do you? Never. Never? No. What about... I mean, when I say never, I occasionally I've had a, a glass, but I never, I would never drink before a gig. I would, I would, you know, I might have had a, a glass of wine if I met somebody or something like that, but that's so rare, mm. just because it's the only tool in your bag. Mm. And, and from my point of view as well, when I first started it, you know, I was I was working, so I was driving to myself to yeah. gigs, and I'm driving on. I just got into the habit that that's not not a thing to do. What what about sorry, mate? What about because I bet you've do, I bet you felt this is um, say you've done and I can't imagine the feeling, but say you've done an arena, you've had all that adrenaline and worry. I can imagine you do get nervous, and then afterwards the arena empties. It's mate, say you're not in Liverpool, say you're somewhere down south or whatever, and then suddenly you're back in your hotel room on your own with no one to talk. That must be the most surreal thing because you want to continue the party. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's so- odd because, um, and again, I, I think with someone like Lee Evans who runs around or even Michael who bounces about, I, 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 I'm pretty low energy. I just sit and tell stories. So what happens? I just walk off, and uh, there's, it, it's a there's a brilliant thing when you're in an arena. Is that sometimes you can get the car behind the stage, so you can literally walk off stage and get in the car and go. Get away from the uh, riffraff. And, and my my cousin uh, David has done all my driving for me last few tours. So I'm with somebody I not I've known all my life, who I'm dead comfortable with. And I and, I, and without any exaggeration, I can get off stage, get in the car, and be asleep in half an hour. How do you put fun? I, no I swear to God, I just That's like get the same me. as a footballer coming off the pitch and being like, right, just one three 0 just and then and I can but if I don't do that, you know, obviously I can I can see people afterwards and stuff like that. But I, I genuinely that's just the thing and if I don't do that, if I do the alternative and I go to a hotel room and I turn the telly on, I'm done. That'll be me till four o'clock in the morning. Because once you get once you allow stimulus in it just pushes you on. Yeah. But if you go, I've, I've, I've finished now, it's time to, that's the only way I can rationalise it. In fact, like I've got a, a Fitbit now. Well, it's not a Fitbit, is it? It's a Garmin. Uh, but you know, any other brands are available. <laughs> <laughs> but like, so it's a heart rate monitor, which I've only just got. And it'd be interesting tonight at tonight's gig, because I was always thinking, do I get nervous? And I don't think I am. And why do I get that drop afterwards and is it is it because I've had an adrenaline rush that I've not noticed and I've mm. come off stage and it's just dropped and that's why I can go to sleep I don't know when you say but, drop what like you just well you know no, like no, no, no no just I just honestly it's not knackered it's not like oh I literally get in I get in the car sometimes put some headphones on just put David Gray on all the time just fall asleep <laughs> but if I don't like tonight I'm driving myself to the gig driving myself home so hopefully I won't fall asleep <laughs> but it'll be the first time I've had one of these on so I think I'll be you're interested in to see there, if my heart rate goes up what, yeah. about, what about you Andy when you finished if you're staying away and they've paid for a hotel for you and all everyone's still there downstairs I'm, in the lobby or something yeah I'm quite a, I hate being on my own I, I need to be I'm quite sad like that I need to, I hate being on my own so I kind of will chat to people afterwards and stuff and I hate being on my own I'm a real people person I try to try and hang on I'm one of the hangers on to the end <laughs> oh sometimes when you do you know your corporate events or some gigs I don't mind hanging around but as I, I guess say, you're doing it all the time as well mm. yeah and when you when you when you're on a a tour yeah you know like like you know the last tour that I did sort of ran for a year and I was only looking at it because I'm looking at putting the next one in and I did 165 dates. 
in Jeez. literally a year. It was from that's crazy. April 31st to March the 1st or something. And you go, wow, that's a lot of dates in it. And within that time, I also went on holiday. And so there were some days where it was just like yeah. 11, 12 days in a run without a day off. And you can't be up there. No. You, and you mm. can't go out drinking. You've used really to, got to look after yourself. I used to, I became friends with the um, people who own Hailwood International, the drinks brand. Oh, yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. And um, ends up going to the, I've been the races with them a few times in their, their big box. And it's all what, like amazing. Lambrusco. <laughs> <laughs> it is though, don't they do Lambrusco? Lambrini. Lambrini. <laughs> oh, right. taking the fist. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lambrini, so all that. Really, really lovely people. So I've got to go in like the box with them and stuff. It's amazing. And then I've got to go to a few dinners with them at birthday parties. And I used to take the piss and say, fucking hell, this is not, this is not work, this. But then the more and more gigs I went to them, I thought, fucking hell, there's like work. You know, people would take the piss out of me and say, yeah. God, you only go round and, you know, you say a few words and you get, go for a few beers and a meal mm. if you're doing that a few times a week it's it, I, listen I, I sound like a, no I'm not listen modern, of it, course yeah yeah no it's, it, it it's, is hard work you think just whining and dining but it's it, it and, and, and it's it's very very easy that's why you know I have the rule not drinking before the gig because all of a sudden you, you, you the the difference the percentage difference I think in it, in terms of a comedian, is really small. You know, like, uh, there's, I'm fortunate enough that I've been able to do big venues and big tours. Uh, and there's, you know, there's a small bracket in that, and then there's another bracket who can do big theatres, and then there's another bracket who can maybe do a few art and then there's another bracket who are doing the club circuit. And the difference between us, I don't think, is that great. Mm. It's small percentages. There's not an Adele of comedy. There's not somebody as a comedian who's as good as Adele as she is yeah. as a singer. There's not somewhere where everyone goes, oh my God, that's just another level. With comedy, it's, it's small percentages mm. and what you've got to do is to make sure that you're, you're as much as you can be within that percentage because you have to deliver consistently. It's all right being great one night and then next time yeah. someone sees you, 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 you're kind of half there because you've had a few drinks or a late night the night before or you can't the, be the thing, um, the thing on a few drinks as well, another good reason which I would say that is I got to go. It's just reminded me this is another embarrassing story. <laughs> I fucking made a right hit to myself this day. I was in the box in the Queen Mother stand, top box, there's politicians there, Alex Ferguson's there, Sir Jeff Hurst, everyone I'm thinking, fucking hell, this is, you know, I've always been in the tats and now I'm in the big, it was amazing. And Peter, my good friend of mine, comes up and says, Andy, um, would like you, I would like you to say Grace, if that's all right, mate. I go, yeah, of course, mate, yeah. Thinking, what the fuck do I say? I've never said Grace before <laughs> in my life. So I'm on the balcony, Googling what to say for Grace. And then anyway, we go in, sit down, and I've necked like a couple of glasses of champagne already, just thinking, fuck. And then he uh, introduces me and said, we've got Andy, a great friend of mine. He saved our country, unfortunately. He was blown up in Afghanistan. Bigs it up loads. <laughs> so then I'm standing there and I went to him. Dear Lord, everyone's got their head bowed, really serious. And I said, dear Lord, thank you for this glorious um, weather you've blessed us with today. Thank you for this great food we're about to, to eat. For the old friends and for the new. So it was, it was going okay. <laughs> and where I fucked it is at the end, rather than saying, you know, finish it and going, amen. I thought I was fucking still on stage and went... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you good, man? God bless. <laughs> and Peter had to stand up next to me and he went, Amen. And I was just like, oh. But that was because I put that down. So I was just so nervous. I just had a yeah. load, load of beer. And, and thankfully, no one was paying me to do a gig. It was just, but I, I put it down to alcohol. And I was thinking, mm. just wasn't thinking things through. And you make a tear to yourself. And yeah, it's a tricky slope, though, like, drinking afterwards and things like that. You know, especially when you try and continue the party and things like that. Mm. It but it's also, it's a very, com comedians also with the last cowboys left. Because you ride into town, do your stuff. You ride in on your own and ride out on your own. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, no matter, like, as I say, whether uh, David with me or Adam with me or, or anyone else, I'm the only person on the stage. Mm. So I'm the only person who I can have the party with afterwards. Yeah. Even though I've got close people to me, I go, that went well. Then I'm thinking, well, well the, 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 you, you, it's never going to feel the same. If you're in a band, you've all shared it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, good and the bad. You know, if you're on stage and you're only thinking, God, this is hard work tonight. It doesn't matter what, what anyone else in the crew says. You're the only one who can get through mm. it. And then in the same vein, if you hit it and you're flying, 
No one else yeah. is getting the same same you know no one else is getting the same lift mm. and so it really is a very isolated thing and so it's a very difficult thing to to continue afterwards because yeah. you are only continuing with yourself yeah i've never thought of it like that i've had it with myself when my dad seen me speak and he's went oh mate it was really good and i've thought was not it? that great was it yeah. was it really yeah. you know what i mean and i've do. known i've done it better other days i'm thinking yeah, yeah. and you peck your own head yeah and it's not fair and it's also difficult for anyone else to to understand because how on earth can you mm. understand what it's like i remember jimmy Carr says i'm dropping all names here and <laughs> i but i only say this because it was a brilliant phrase and he, he said it when i interviewed him on, on my show he said he said you've got to accept if you're a comedian or even a public speaker you you are odd there's you and everyone pretends that you know but you are odd because in a room you're the only one facing the wrong way <laughs> and I thought it is true isn't it yeah. yeah it is that bit where you go right they're all here everyone's looking that way right well I'm, I'll go look that way and, <laughs> and, and then you throw it all out there yeah mate right. I think 20 past 3 you've got to shoot I've, I've got to go I've got to go and see yeah uh, I could chat to you all. There was so many things. I just wanted to let the conversation oh, go. Oh, no. I know. Same. I'm going to the uh, Liverpool Homeless Football. This is a, a charity I've been involved with for a few years. Uh, so I'm just going to, go and have a catch up with them, really. Well, just a quick, because I'll end up talking to you for ages. Yeah, yeah. You raised uh, 4.2 million. Is that, is that still a record, is it? A record? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know whether it is. I, I think it might be for, for sport it's, relief. It yeah, probably sport is, relief, yeah. yeah. I mean, listen, the, the, of all the things that I've done, I, that was a very nice, gratifying thing to do, but you're, you're part of something. You know, when you see other people do stuff, and I know you've done stuff where they do it on their own, you go, well, that's different. But when you've got that infrastructure behind you, that, that, that's what raises the money. Mm. Doing mm. what you do doesn't It's amazing, cha- hard challenge, though. <clears throat> Didn't yeah, take that away from yourself. It was a uh, three marathons uh, in the end. So yeah, yeah. Cycling from Paris to Calais. Yeah, Paris to Calais. Row the Rowing channel. And three and then, marathons. Yeah. What was the hardest? The rowing. Was it? Yeah. Cause it's, I seen the bit where you're hallucinating. Yeah, I was gone. Because <laughs> I only had, <clears throat> had the, the the ride from <clears throat> sorry, the ride from Paris to Calais is about 185 miles, and the underestimated how long it was going to take and because of all the press and stuff you, we set off late so that meant that I got there late and because we were rowing and you had to row with the tide it meant I only had an hour's kip and uh, and, uh, and I was in a rowboat <clears throat> a six man rowboat and there was me uh, Denise Williams Davina McCall and Freddie Flintoff so there was four of us rowing the six man boat and, and it's, it's rowing. I mean, yeah. like, even Freddie was like, Jesus Christ, no, no wonder you got a knighthood for this. This is boring as <laughs> shit. I mean, like, and it's like 13 hours of rowing, and halfway through it, I was just gone. I was... And the, the medical boat came up and just put something in my hand, and I, I, I swear, I don't know what was in it, but <laughs> you could have water skied off the back. After, I mean, just, 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 it was the best gear I've ever had. <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, yeah, so, the video. but that that did me in, and but and then the run. Once you, well, you know, so once you're running, it's just you just got to go. Just one foot in front of the it's other, just got to put another leg forward. That's mm. it. But when you when you, because we the difficulty that we had because we were rowing and because obviously it's the channel, it's tidal, you start drifting off course, then it gets harder and yeah. harder and harder. Um, but you know, thankfully, it all went well in the end. Any more challenges lined up like that? No, and I'll tell you why. There's a few things. One, I was because afterwards you do something like that and think, oh, I'll do something else, I'll do something else. Uh, but there's just that little bit about going, it took me a long time to get over it. A, a, or a physically lot. or mentally? F- physically, physically, my hips and everything. Uh, because literally everyone's around you and the support me- network's around you and then everyone just goes. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like I didn't even have physio booked and I was going home on crutches the next day thinking I should, I should have organised something there. <laughs> and so th- that, and I actually said that to him, look, you need to have some kind of uh, infrastructure in place. And then I remember because I'd had this, um, this shin splints and I was hobbling for the last day, 
everyone that I met kept on saying to me, how's, how's your leg, how's your leg? And then I was hosting the Sport Relief on, on a, the BBC about five weeks later, something like that. And, uh, and David Williams came in and David Williams said, how's your head? And he was the first person to say, how's your head? I said, it's fucked. <laughs> it's fucked because all of a sudden, from spending months building up to something and having all this pressure and you don't yeah. realise how, how many people are involved, it goes. You go into this really dark thing and he he knew because he'd swam the channel, he'd done various other things for them and he said it's, it's, yeah. it messes you up a bit in your head. And I spoke to Davine, I spoke to other people who've done it and it, it is, there is something about that that's different than like going to run a marathon somewhere because it's all on you. Yeah. Um, and not in a bad way, but it is something that you go, right, it's like... a massive mass like, comes down though, isn't it? Yeah, like Melanie, it. my wife, said, look, really, like, you're not going to beat what you've done. So just leave it. Yeah. Just leave it as a thing, because the last thing you want to do is, to, is for everyone to go, oh, you're going to try and beat more than 4.2 million. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't want to do something, raise a million quid and be disappointed. Yeah. So leave it and then just do your own things on the side, which yeah. is what I do now. Dead, dead quick, mate. I put out just to a few of the lads this morning. Said any questions? People wanted that my mate to vegan. He said, "Why are you a veggie?" Because I was working in a hamburger shop in Guernsey, mm. uh, and I, uh, I, I had to go and collect the meat off the farmer, and I walked into the wrong room at the wrong time on the wrong day. Okay. <laughs> so that was thirty-three years ago. And that was enough. Uh, and the second one was um, I met your wife when we were on holiday. Hell, was um, were you always into animals, or is that just a recent thing? I see your uh, social media. Oh no, no! What's happened? We uh, or... well, you couldn't be, could we? Because obviously we we had a you know a normal house and normal no lived a normal life, and then and then what happened when when we moved more out to the countryside? We moved into Cheshire. We had this land, and then Melanie's just adopted these animals, and now they can add a species here forever. Going, listen, we found. <laughs> You found a pig with a limp, do you want it? So you just end up with all these things. And it's lovely. It, it, in some respects, I wish we'd have been able to do all of this when the kids were younger. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because honestly, I, I bring, me mates bring their kids who are like five and six. My little girl, she's four, she's got a horse. I was, with her, was horse riding with her yesterday and the kids love The joy of it, so. the joy, and it's great. But obviously, you know, yeah, we weren't in this position in yeah. those days. Listen, mate, I'll, I'll keep you rabbiting on all day. I just want to say a massive thanks again for taking the time out to come and see us. Yeah, really appreciate um, it. The problem no. we've got now, Tom, is out. we've seven episodes in and we've already landed on John yeah, Bishop, no. so we're fucked now. To yeah. be honest. Don't call, put it out. Just call it a day Just don't put it out yeah. and, then, and then you can slip it out once I as a Christmas special. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes just, no sense at all, does it? No. Hey, it's a Christmas special we did in February. <laughs> no, thanks so much, no, mate. Yeah, honestly, mate. Thanks, thanks you. I want you to know, Tom, I did it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Got nothing to do with it. <laughs>